Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome Father Tom Wynandy to give this final talk on our Lenten mission for 2024. I first met Father Tom the day he was ordained to the priesthood uh, in uh, 2052 years ago. Now, he's a, he's a native of Delphos, Ohio, and he graduated from St. Fidelis College in 1969, I think it was. Um, uh, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> St. Fidelis being about six miles from my hometown of Butler, Pennsylvania. Now, Father Tom has had a very distinguished career. He taught for a number of years at, at Oxford University in England, had worked for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, you know, for about eight years, and he's, he's, a, he's a very prolific author. I think two of my favorite books, and they're, 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 they're challenging reading, it would be Jesus Becoming Jesus, A Theological Interpretation of Synoptic Gospels, one volume, and then two volumes on the Gospel of John. So they're very, very meaty things that Father Tom has to say. So I'm delighted he's going to be with us tonight to give us this talk, uh, you know, closing out our Latin mission. So Father Tom, welcome. And Father, I, Lewis, I'm, I'm also supposed to start with a prayer, so let's do that as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Direct, we beseech you, our Lord, our actions by our holy inspirations, and grant we may carry them out by your gracious assistance, so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from you, and by you be happily ended. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I'm very pleased and uh, uh, honored, really, to be able to give the last Lenten, uh, Lenten mission talk. Uh, so it's very good to, to be here with all of you be, before uh, tonight, this evening. Uh, as you know, uh, we're following the chapters, or have been following the chapters in, in this book, uh, the Liturgy, the Source, and Summit of Our Christian Life by Cornelia, Cornina Lachlan. And so I'm uh, supposed to talk on the last chapter, which has to do with being sent uh, out in mission. Um, at the liturgy, the climax of the liturgy, or the end of the liturgy, is that we are sent out into mission. Um, uh, having participated in the Lord's Passion at Mass and Resurrection and having received Him in Communion, uh, we go out. We are supposed to go out and, and perform our mission. Uh, the question is, <clears throat> what is that mission? What is that mission? And what are we to do as individuals and as a parish? Uh, uh, the author, Lachlan, doesn't tell us. He tells us we're sent out in, in mission, but she doesn't specify exactly what that mission is or how we are supposed to, to do it. Um, but, you know, we, at the end of Mass, it, it's very clear. Go forth, the Mass is ended. What are we supposed to go forth to do? Well, we're supposed to go forth to come to our mission. Uh, or go announce the gospel of the Lord. Well, how do we go out and announce the gospel of the Lord? Or another uh, 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 is that we should go in peace, glorifying the Lord with our life. Well, how are we to go in peace, and how are we to glorify the Lord with our life? Uh, so, tonight, so tonight I, I'd like to take up um, what that mission is and how we can perform it. Now, it strikes me that in, under, in order to go to perform our mission, we need to um, uh, have a clear knowledge of the primacy of Jesus, the primacy of Christ, that he alone reigns supreme he is the Lord and Savior. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings. 
He's the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And in him alone do we have salvation, that we can be saved in no other name, in the name of Jesus. If we're not convinced, if we're not convinced of sort of the primacy of Jesus, uh, and that he reigns supreme, and that we can only be saved in his name, uh, we will not go out and fulfill our mission. We would not go out to preach the gospel. And so I'd like to begin tonight with looking at uh, three scripture passages that speak about the primacy of Jesus. The first one is from Colossians uh, chapter 1 verses 11 to 20. Um, it says, May you be strengthened with all power, according to his gracious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. He delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of our sins. So it's because all these things have taken place in us that we're part of the kingdom of God. We've been transformed into his kingdom. We believe that Jesus is the Father's Son. Paul goes on, he says, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn before all creation. When we speak of the primacy of Christ, the first thing we need to realize is that he is the one who is the firstborn before all creation. The Father begot him from all eternity. From all eternity the Father begot his Son before all things were made. And then all things were created uh, through him or in him. The Father created everything through his Son. The Word of God. In the beginning of John's Gospel it says, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it goes, as all things were created through him, God spoke his Word. And by speaking his Word, through his Word, things came to be. And it goes on to say, all things visible and invisible, in heaven and on earth. There's nothing, nothing, whether it's angels or the world we see around us, whether it's invisible or invisible, the Father created through his Son. And he created the, through his Son and everything for his Son. He wanted to give his Son glory. And one of the ways that he could do that is be creating everything for him, that everything would be able to give glory to God, what is invisible and what is visible. You and I, you and I, we may not consider this at times, but you and I are created for Jesus, to give glory to Jesus. Uh, everything else, in a sense, does it automatically, but you and I have free wills, and we should use our free wills to give glory and praise to the Lord Jesus Christ for whom we have been created. He goes on, Paul says, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So not only is the Jesus, the Son of God, the firstborn before all creation, and so he reigns supreme over the order of creation, he also reigns supreme over the order of redemption. He is the head of the body, the church. And the reason that he's the head of the body of the church is because he's the firstborn from the dead. All of us will be born from the dead as well at the end of time. We will rise from our tombs. We will, Jesus will call us out of our tombs. But Jesus is the firstborn. It's only because Jesus is the firstborn of all the, uh, from the dead, uh, the first one to rise gloriously from the dead, that everyone else who abided on him here on earth will rise and and be glorified with him at the end of time. And in this way, Paul says, he will be preeminent in every way. 
both in the order of creation and in the order of redemption. And he says the reason for this is because for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Jesus is the Son of God made man. The fullness of God dwelt in Jesus. He became incarnate. And so when we look at Jesus and we think of Jesus, we think here is a man in whom the fullness of the God had dwelt. Here we find a man who's truly the Son of God. And because of this too, he reconciled us to himself. Because of sin, we were not reconciled to the Father. But now, because of the redemption we have in Jesus Christ, he has reconciled everything in himself, again, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. It's through Jesus' death on the cross that we have been saved. Through his blood we're cleansed and so reconciled to God our Father. The other passage I want to look at is from Ephesians chapter 1. Um, verses 3 to 10, which is again another uh, hymn or poem uh, describing the primacy of Jesus. Again, Paul states, he tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are to bless and we are to glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, why should we do this? Well, the reason is, is because God our Father has blessed us, blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Notice that Paul does not say he blessed us with earthly blessings in earthly places. All those blessings pass away. But what God has done for us through his son, Jesus Christ, is bestow on us heavenly blessings, heavenly blessings from the heavens itself. And the one of them is that he, he, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless. Again, this is a marvelous mystery. From all eternity, from all eternity, we were chosen, you and I were chosen to be in Christ before all of creation, before the foundation of the world, from all eternity. There never was a time when God did not choose us to be in Christ. And he chose us to be in Christ so that we would be holy. Holiness is a it's a hard thing to describe. Holiness means not only that God is all perfect and all good, but there's something magnificent and incomprehensible, the fact that God is holy. There's nothing evil, no taint of, of sin or imperfection. He is just all holy and is blameless. He never did anything that was wrong. And he wants us, he wants us to be holy as he is holy. He desires us to be blameless before him. And Paul then says, he destined us to, in love to be his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. What, what the Father's purpose is, what he willed, is that we, we should be his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was eternally the Son of the Father. But he wanted us to be adopted sons and daughters of the Father. He wanted us to be his children as well. And so that we might praise him for the graciousness that he has bestowed upon us. And so much did he love us that in Christ we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our sins, even when we lost our holiness and lost our, our blamelessness, God and his love for us reconciled us to himself. He redeemed us through the blood of his son, Jesus, 
so that we might have forgiveness of our trespasses. And again, Paul emphasizes this is the riches of God's grace that he has bestowed upon us. And lastly, Paul says, God in his love for us has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will. What is the mystery of his will? According to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. What is the end of all of this? What's the purpose of all this? Where are we headed? He says that all things would be united in him. Again, things in heaven and things on earth. The whole goal of creation, the whole goal of redemption, is that the whole universe, and in particularly you and I and the whole of humankind, find its unity in Jesus Christ, that everything would be summed up in him, that he would take into himself all that is, so that everything would become a new creation in Christ, heaven and earth, we would become new creations in Christ, and we would live with him in Christ in communion with the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. The last passage I want to look at concerning the primacy of Christ is Philippians <clears throat> chapter 2, uh, five, 5 to 11. It says, Have this mind among yourselves that was in Christ Jesus. We should have the mind of Christ Jesus. And what was the mind of Christ Jesus? Who, though he was in the form of God, from all eternity, the Son was God as the Father was God. He had the very form of God. He was divine from all eternity. But even though he was, from all eternity, was divine, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped at. Even though he was God, he did not grasp after his divinity. He did not say, man, I am the Son of God, I'm God, and it's mine. No, that's not what he did. He did not count his equality with God a thing to be grasped, but rather he emptied himself. How did he empty himself? By taking on the form of a servant. From all eternity he was in the form of God, but in his humility and kindness and goodness, out of love for us, he took on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of you and me, born in the likeness of men. So humble was he, that he took on the very form of a servant. And being found in human form, he humbled himself even further and became obedient unto death. Not only did he become a servant as a human being, but having become that, he became obedient, obedient to his Father's will, even unto death, even unto death, dying on a cross. We see the level of Jesus' humility. He was God, but he was willing to become a servant. But not only a servant, he was born in the likeness of you and me. And not only was he born in the likeness of you and me, but he humbled himself even unto death. And not just any death, he humbled himself to death, even death on a cross even death on the cross. We see how much Jesus loved us and how humble he was. And then we come to what I think is uh, one of the most important words. Therefore, therefore, having done, having been all, being obedient and humble, even unto death, therefore, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him, uh, exalted him, and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. He bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. 
the extremity of Jesus' humility, he, through that he merited, merited, therefore, God exalted him above every other name. Again, in heaven and on earth, there's no greater name than Jesus, no greater name than Jesus in heaven and on earth. And because of this, because of this, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We should recognize that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all. And when we recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, we give glory to the Father because we're reconci re recognizing that the Father himself, the Father himself bestowed on Jesus the name that is above every other name. Jesus' name is Lord. He is our Lord and he's the Lord of the whole universe. Because of this, because of the primacy of Jesus, it demands that, or should elicit, not so much demand, but elicit from us a great love for Jesus. How can we not love Jesus who loves us so much in creating us and redeeming us, even upon, up to the point of dying on the cross for us. Now, in order to love Jesus, it's necessary that we have a personal relationship with him. Pope Benedict um, emphasized this so much he, in his encyclicals and in his uh, preaching, um, he emphasized the importance of all Christians and all Catholics, the need to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And by that he meant that Jesus must be alive for us. And we must know him, not just facts about him, we must know him as we know our family. We have personal relationships with our family, with our spouses, our children, our grandchildren, our relatives, our friends. Uh, we don't just know them abstractly. We know them personally. And the same should be true with our relationship to Jesus. Because Jesus is alive, he's risen we can have a personal relationship with him. This is unique, you know, no other religion talks in this manner. No one talks about having a personal relationship with, with Muhammad. Uh, no one talks about having a personal relationship with Buddha. Uh, the reason is they're not alive, they're dead. And they're prophets, all they did was tell us something. But Jesus saved us through his death and resurrection and it's by having a personal relationship with him that we're able to obtain the benefits of his saving work. We're able to die to sin and rise with him to new life. We are able, because we abide in Jesus, to have eternal life. But that's all dependent upon our having a personal relationship with him. And our personal relationship then must be one of love. And so in order to have a personal relationship with him, it's an ongoing process, but it's something that, that we should, uh, also demands an initial decision, an initial decision. We need to turn away from sin and give our lives to him. We want to need to have we need to want Jesus more than we want anything else or anyone else. We want Jesus first. We want Jesus first above anything in this world and even beyond the friendships that we have with other people. We are to give our lives over to him just as he has given his life over to us. He held nothing back in becoming man and dying on the cross for us and 
and rising from the dead and sending forth his Holy Spirit upon us, he gave himself entirely on our behalf. And we too, we too, must give our lives entirely to Jesus. There has to be a bond of love, a personal love. Personal relationships are based on personal love. We need to have a bond of love with Jesus, a bond that's cemented in our faith. The faith is giving ourselves to Jesus. And in giving ourselves to Jesus in faith, we, are, we create a bond of love with him. And by creating a bond of love with him, we hope in him. We hope in him that all that he promises will be fulfilled. Our eternal life with him and all the saints and angels in heaven. Only if we have a living and loving relationship with Jesus will we then, will we then proclaim and bear witness to him to others in the world. This is the sine qua non, the thing about which all our being sent out in mission is dependent upon. Only if we love Jesus and his redemption will we be able, be we be willing to go forth and proclaim that gospel to others. Only in loving him can we fulfill our mission. Let me stop there for a second. Anybody have any questions or thoughts? Anything that's not clear? Everybody's happy? <coughs> All right, okay, okay. Now, this, what I just said, is not easy. It's not easy. The author of our book acts as if it's easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. And it's not easy because of our present culture and in our world today. There's a great deal of antagonism and even hatred for Christianity and particularly at times for Catholicism. And ultimately, there's an antagonism against Jesus himself. The world we live in, the culture that's around us, does not want to know Jesus. They do not like what Jesus stands for, what he teaches. They do not like what the Catholic Church teaches. And we can see this in the fact that uh, over the past year or so, uh, so many Catholic churches, schools, other things that pertain to the Catholic Church, pro-life clinics, uh, are vandalized. There have been at least 400, I think, so far. Um, it shows you a sign how much the world is not in love with Jesus and not in love with the Church and how actually they're antagonistic of Jesus and what he has done. Um, so, it takes courage and conviction to profess Jesus as the Lord. Um, it takes courage. We need to pray for courage. I think courage is one of the most important virtues that is needed today. Without courage, to proclaim Jesus as Lord, Jesus will not be proclaimed. And we need conviction. We need the conviction to profess Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But we again, we will only do this. We will only do this if we love him. And we will only do this if we love others. We have to not only love Jesus, we have to love others because we want others to be saved. We want others to be saved. Uh, many live lives in sin, uh, but that leads to condemnation and ultimately can lead to hell. It's these people that we love. We love them so much that we want to preach the gospel. We want to bear witness to Jesus, even if they end up hating us, all right? Uh, you know, Jesus preached the gospel, he ended up hating him. Uh, he ended up being crucified. Now, we're probably not getting crucified, literally, but we, 
we could get a bad name for ourselves. People may end up not liking us at all. But the reason we're willing to do this is because we love the world as Jesus loved the world. And we love others as Jesus loved others. And so we want to bring them salvation. Now, whether we like it or not, um, we're in the midst of a cultural war uh, in our country, in, in, in the Western world, Europe, um, not so much maybe in Africa, somewhat in, in um, South America, Central America. Um, in Asia, there can be a cultural war. You, you can get in big trouble by professing your faith in Russia and China and places of that nature. But we're in a cultural war. Uh, and our culture is imbued uh, with a secular gospel. It doesn't want to be imbued with the gospel that we want to preach. It's imbued with a secular gospel, a state of disbelief. You know, it's to remain in that state of disbelief. And I think the, one of the big reasons is, is because we, there's a great stress on individualism. And it had a great stress of individualism means that there's a great stress on the will, the desire or the demand that I, what I will, I'm going to do, and no one is going to stop me. The will becomes supreme. And so what I will to do, what I will to think, becomes supreme. And no one, no one, can put barriers to my will. It's my will that reigns. Pope Benedict again talked about a culture of relativism. That is, everything is relative. All morals are relative. There's no supreme good or bad. There's no such thing as sin. If I will something, it's fine for me. The problem is that while there's a cultural relativism where the world reigns supreme or individuals reign supreme, the only thing that is not permitted is Jesus and his teaching. The only thing that will not be tolerated is Christianity and in particular at times the Catholic Church. Nonetheless, nonetheless, this is our mission. This is our mission. This is not an easy task, but it's the mission that Jesus has given to us. Now, what are the issues that make for this cultural war in which we now live? What are the issues where we see this cultural war being waged? Now, I don't want to overemphasize this, but it strikes me that the primary issues of today where the cultural war is being waged is over sexuality and the nature of sexuality. The world that strikes me in our culture, that strikes me, is obsessed with sex. You see it all around you, you know. Uh, it's all over. It seems that the whole world, especially in the United States, you know, Canada, Western Europe, particularly is obsessed with sex. And so there's a freedom, a freedom in all sexual expressions. No sexual expression can be disallowed. Uh, and because of this, what is lost is the whole traditional understanding of marriage and family life. Uh, marriage and family life is, it, is under attack because sexuality has now been, been, been taken away, broken free from marriage and family life and the beginning of children. Uh, 
Sexuality is no longer seen by God creating men and women in his image and likeness. And so everything, everything is allowed because sexuality is no longer part of what it means to have a marriage and what it means to have a family. And we find this in, in many expressions. Um, um, we find it in, you know, all the, uh, the promoting of homosexuality and homosexual relationships, of adultery and fornication, of transgenderism, uh, where we can choose whether we are male or female, independent upon how we are bodily made. We see it in the proliferation of pornography that becomes so addictive, especially among men. All of these are self-destructive. Ultimately, they're destructive. They lead to depression, and they also can lead to death. Um, you know, I read, you read quite frequently that so many suicides, there, there are so many suicides among transgender girls. Um, the, the Netherlands, of all places, <laughs> have made a study of this, um, which is one of the most sexually promiscuous countries in the world. Uh, but they made a study of this and found that there's a huge percentage of, of suicides among transgender girls, girls who believe or want to be, be men. It can be deadly. It can be deadly. It can be to provide depression and destruction that leads to great deals of evil. However, these are not the only issues besides those, there are, there are other issues besides those of, of sexuality. We see in our culture today a tension between the races because of racial prejudice, and not simply among blacks and whites, but Hispanics have now come into the picture as well, uh, not liking Hispanics, Hispanics not liking blacks, blacks not liking um, uh, Hispanics, uh, nobody liking white people, especially white men. Um, and so it's become a real, a real issue in, in, the, in the mix. Uh, and now, you know, there's a rise in anti-Semitism. Um, and immigration, you know, we see all, all you know, people, people come across the border, and, and it, it seems we cannot, and it, we don't have the mind, the heart, to put together a policy that is both just and compassionate in response to this. We just don't know how to work things out anymore. And again, there's also Islamic terrorism. Not all Muslims are terrorists. But there are radical groups like we see in Hamas and other radical groups throughout the world. Um, I don't know if you, Nigeria is one of the is the most populous country in Africa, but in the northern part of Nigeria, it, the uh, Burkina Faso, I think it's called, is a, in the area and in, in, in the area, and there's a lot of. Uh, Muslims killing Christians, hundreds of them, hundreds of them, uh, kidnapping Catholic girls in girls' schools and taking them off. Um, uh, it's, it's very, very sad, very, very dangerous, and, and, and something to really pray that the Lord would protect um, us from this, this persecution that's, that's brought about by Islamic terrorism. In the midst of all this, we need to, as the point being made, we need to bear witness to Jesus as loyal Catholics. We need to bear witness to Jesus as loyal Catholics. Um, we must be formed in our Catholic faith. And we must bear witness to our Catholic faith. 
because only Christianity and our Catholic faith will find the true meaning of life in Jesus Christ. And only in Jesus can all the divisions and hatred that we see around us so much can be resolved. And so today, so tonight, I want to just emphasize once more that we should love Jesus, and in loving Jesus, preach the gospel. But as I said, this is not easy. Paul, St. Paul, knew that this was not easy. In his second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, um, chapter 4, he says, verses 1 to 5, I charge you, that, that's Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, preach the word, be urgent in season and out of season. Preach the word in season urgently, urgently. We should preach the word in season and out of season. I don't know if there's ever been a case where there's been an in season. <laughs> it's always out of season. The gospel is always out of season. It's never in season. That's what makes it so difficult. It's never in season. Uh, convinced. Convince the world of Jesus. Rebuke the world of sin. <laughs> Exhort the world. Be unfailing in patience and in teaching. We have to be patient. We have to be patient in our teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. The time is coming when the, the, when the world will not uh, um, uh, endure sound teaching. That's definitely the case today. But having itching ears, the world has itching ears, itching ears. Um, it wants to hear, it desires to hear all sorts of things. Um, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teaching to suit their own likings. That's what's happening in the world today. With itching ears, everybody wants to find teaching that suits their own likings and not what Jesus likes. And the will to turn away from listening to the truth. The world does not want to listen to the truth and they wander off in myths. As for you, always be steady. We are to be steady. Enduring suffering. That's one of my points. This will not be easy. It will cause suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. That's our mission, to do the work of evangelists and be steady at it, even when it causes us to endure suffering. Fulfill your ministry, your mission. Fulfill your ministry, fulfill your mission by preaching the gospel, by being evangelist, no matter what suffering you may endure. Jesus laid down his life for the world, and we now are to lay down our lives, because it's only in laying down our lives that we, like Jesus, can save the world. Amen. Amen. All right. Any questions or thoughts now? Comments? Do you think I'm too pessimistic? Do you think? <laughs> Thank you for the lecture, very interesting. And uh, yeah, I, I don't think that so you are pessimistic, but I think sometimes if we saw the history, I think we are better now than 2,000 years ago. And 2,000 years ago, as a Christian, we could go to end it in the Coliseum and throw out to the lion. Now we could get here, happily discuss and I think we are better than 2,000 years ago. So you see the history too, 1,200 or 1,300. 
and all he, Europe was conquered by the Moros, by the Muslims, and was worse than now. We no, we are in the cultural war, but even though we are feel that we are better than than the past. You're right. Definitely. You're you're right. I mean, in one sense, you know, but, here but, we are gathered at our. Huh? Oh, sorry. But, but notwithstanding, we need to do better. Mm -hmm. We could be better to mm -hmm. proclaim the word of Jesus, invite lies to the people, and uh, know more too. No, uh, by no said because there are many denominations outside, like uh, the witness of a group. They they try to teach us because sometimes as a Catholic. We sometimes we didn't read the Bible or we, we couldn't have the answers. But uh, I think as a responsibility for us is learn more when we have this talk to attend, to learn more and, and to, talk, to discuss and also teach them that our faith is you know is worldwide and is really, really more powerful and more like a community better than many other denomination too. Okay. Yes, I think you're right. In one sense we are better off. But I think um, Catholics, Christians, uh, are subtly persecuted uh, in our culture. Uh, I know uh, some um, young people who wanted to go on to be doctors, but they would not accept it because they were pro-life and would not perform abortions. And so they were not accepted. You know, um, you know. I think uh, uh, sort of the elites, the progressives within our country, are very antagonistic towards Christianity and religion. You know, uh, in the media, Hollywood, uh, all the sort of politicians uh, can be very, very. Uh, antagonistic towards Catholics, even if they are Catholics. So, okay, anybody else? Father, you mentioned faith formation as being really important to evangelization. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about um, how the church is doing today in that respect. Uh, you know, I think that the church has um, really done a wonderful job in using media, a variety of media mm -hmm. now that has, you know, developed mm -hmm. um, quite a bit and using it to yeah. spread the faith. Right. Um, and certainly we have Catholic schools and we have religious ed yeah. programs. Yeah. But what do you see as perhaps um, important to the future uh, to really be mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. able to right. to form the faith in young people. Right. Um, I think a number of things. Uh, I think there's some very bright spots uh, today. Um, I think you know someone like Bishop Barron um, is doing a very good job at evangelizing. Uh, EWTN, I think, is is doing quite a good job as well as helping to evangelize through the, their television network and, and radio uh, and, and that. Uh, I think um, uh, Catholic schools, it kind of depends. I think some are, are, are doing very good. I, again, it depends on the teachers. I'm very concerned if te the teachers who teach in the Catholic schools aren't ardently Catholic themselves. They, they have to bear witness to the students what great thing it is to be Catholic. Um, and that's not always happening, you know. Back when you and I were growing up, I don't know about yourself, but I lived in a very Catholic environment in a small town in Northwest Ohio. Uh, it was almost all German and about 80, 85% Catholic. And our Catholic school uh, was three or four times the size of the public school, and we had 28 nuns teaching in our Catholic school. Uh, you don't find that today. 
I mean, there are some tremendous orders of nuns. I think of the, uh, the Dominican sisters in Nashville and other places. Uh, they're doing a marvelous job, and some of the new, new religious orders of nuns are doing a marvelous job in that respect. Um, so, but um, we live in a different environment now where, where it's very important for Catholic schools to be uh, Catholic. And I think, you know, um, you know, CCD, or for kids who, you know, to how to get some classes for those who do not go to Catholic school, I think is very, very Im important. Um, you know, the key to this, um, to my mind, I don't want to be chauvinistic, is men. The church is not going to be renewed until we have more men coming to church than we have women. All right? Because it's men who keeps the children. If dad doesn't go to mass, then I don't have to go to mass when I become older. You know, mom will take him, okay. But once they get teenagers, you know, if it's not important for dad, it doesn't have to be important for me. And so I, I think uh, moms are obviously pretty important. But dads, I think, dads don't realize how important they are when it comes to passing on the faith and bringing their children up Catholic so that they, the children, remain Catholics. That's what, you know, it's not always possible, but, you know, when, again, when we were growing up, families, dad, mom, the kids, they all went to Mass together, you know, and I think that's, that's still important today, of families going, going to Mass on Sundays together. And again, if they don't see the faith being lived out in the family, Catechism classes aren't going to do much good, you know. Uh, if they don't see that the mom and dad has living faith, trying to tell the kids that how important Jesus is isn't going to make too much difference to them. Okay? Do you think I'm right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, add because uh, right now we are doing consecration to Saint Joseph. We're, we're giving consecration to Saint Joseph. 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 Saint Joseph. Oh, Saint Joseph. Oh, yeah. wow. yes. Uh, we do it every Thursday. Yesterday was our fifth session. All right. And we really learned a lot. It is. Uh huh. Our second year yes. and yesterday our discussion was about um men right like what you said well saint joseph yes i th i i my devotion to saint joseph and his priest tremendously his feast day is coming up here in a couple of days march 19th yeah, march yeah. yes yes uh and so i think we need to pray to saint joseph yeah. for raising up good men you know mm -hmm. he was in he, he may have been the foster father of jesus but if he wasn't in that home with Mary and Jesus, something integral would have been missing. You know, he took the place of God the Father, um, and so it's it's important. The Holy Family is the sign of what a family uh, should be. And that's what uh, Father Donald Calloway um, <coughs> he introduced the consecration to Saint Joseph, Joseph. and then Pope Francis did. Um, St. Joseph, year of St. Joseph in 2020. So that's a good yeah, yes, impact. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, okay. So we can bring men. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you. you have a question. I commend and thank you for your part in the development of the iPhone and Android app for Catholics, the confession app? Well, yes, did you ask me about this when I left church? I did, yeah, I, I needed to verify that, uh, yeah. that you really were a part of it. And well, I was, but I was, I was just, I was, uh, I, my part was quite small, really. I, I provided some of the, uh, I, I wrote examination of conscience uh, for children, young adults, uh, single, mature people, re priests and religious, and married couples. It's uh, a beautiful uh, piece of work. Well, yeah. you you know, if you they're on. Uh, if you go on the U.S. Catholic, uh, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops website, 
and type in examinations of conscience, they all pop up. Uh, and so... You don't need the app. You don't need the app. You don't need the app because they're on the, on the website. Um, and so uh, I think on the website it says to print these out and use them at parish. You need Father Wine Andy's permission. So I get uh, emails every once in a while asking if it's okay because I always give it. I just said, you know, in my pride, so let's make sure it says Tom Wine Andy at the end. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 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 yeah. You got to collect so, royalties. <laughs> well, no, I did get royalties though on the app. Oh, uh, I think I, yes, they gave me because I helped them out. Who, the two guys who did it, I think they, they they were from South Bend. I don't think they were related to Notre Dame University, but I think they lived in South Bend, and uh, uh, they gave me royalties. It was quite a bit. The first, I don't know how, if they're still selling or not. Uh, if this app is still available, but uh, um, uh, I, I got a very nice royalty at the end of the first year. Your reward will be great in heaven yes, also. Yes, well, I'd like to think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I'm grateful that I don't have to use the app because I've been a victim of identity theft, and I'm, <laughs> I worry about the security of having to have a sign-in and a password, and yeah. if you can get it from the U.S. Conference of yeah, Catholic yeah, yes, Bishops, that's, right. that's win. right. Thank yeah. you very much. They all, they all, all, they're all there. Thank you. Okay. All right. Are we all done? Everybody's happy? All right, well, let's pray. Yes, let's do that. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we come before you, and we give you our hearts and our minds, all that we are, as you have given yourself to us. And we ask you to fill us with the spirit of love, the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of wisdom. Enliven our hearts that we might know you and love you. And in knowing and loving you, we might bear witness to you in all that we say and do. Give us hearts that are willing to testify to your glory out of love for people so that they might find salvation in you. In Jesus, we ask this in your name. For you are the Lord and you live forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right, all of you have a good rest of the evening. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Father Tom, we'd like to thank you for such a wonderful and thought-provoking um, talk to mm -hmm. us tonight. Okay, it thank was, you. It was excellent. Can we all give Father Tom a hand? Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. This concludes our talk tonight. All right.